welcome to Beyond Talking Points from Little Vision News Bookstore. I'm Bridget Jackson Buckley, and today I'm talking with Winifred Bird. Winifred is a journalist, translator, and the author of Eating Wild Japan, Tracking the Culture of Foraged Foods. Okay, so Winifred, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really pleased to be here. Yes, and I am so excited to speak with you. So you grew up in San Francisco. You write a book, a family of book-loving artists dreaming of moving to the country. I love that line. <laughs> Thank you. That's pretty much me in a nutshell at like seven years old. So. Yeah, so so I want to I want to get into that. But after studying political science at Amherst College, you worked at forums across the US and Canada. So we know San Francisco is an urban environment. So where did the interest for farming derive from? I honestly have no idea, but I remember being like six or seven years old and like dreaming about being like taken in by an Amish family and living with them and like drafting a letter to be like, can, can you show me the ways of the <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, although I do remember my relatives in Pennsylvania taking me to vi visit the Amish, so that might have might have been part of it. And um, you know, we'd go on drives outside the the city sometimes. And um, but yeah, I grew up in a really urban urban family, um, right in the center, you know, right in San Francisco. Um, and yeah, both my parents were artists. My stepdad's a musician and an artist as well. Um, and I, I love that urban culture, but something about food and farming has just always really attracted me. Um, and we, we also went to the farmer's market in San Francisco quite often. My mom was a, a great cook and uh, she would always take me shopping there with her. So that might've been part of it. Well, it, it just, it, it jumped, the line jumped out at me, um, dreaming of moving to the country because so many people, you know, sometimes can talk about that. Oh, you know, fantasize about, this peaceful, calm country life, but obviously the move doesn't come to fruition. But you really carried through with that and moved out to a country environment and a rural setting. So I wonder, it's, it's just curious, like I wonder what it is about that rural aspect that sometimes quietly speaks to us because San Francisco is very, very urban. Like we were just up there actually last weekend and it's so dense, it's so dense. I get, it's beautiful. I used to live up in the northern area, uh, northern California, so it's beautiful to drive across the Bay Bridge and look at the water. But at the same time, just the idea of quiet, you know, pastures, butterflies, I don't know, it just calls to you. <laughs> um, for me, it was, yeah, partly that like pastoral image, I'm sure, but I was always focused on like, kind of the practical aspects of like growing food and like you know I would think about like okay I, I need to have like one cow and five chickens and like oh. you know <laughs> yeah I, I honestly don't know I think it's just something I was born with um okay. didn't necessarily come from my family um okay and then I just kind of pursued it later on in college and after college and I've I've kind of grown you know, through different phases in my life, like grown away from it. And I'm currently in a coming back to it again phase. I feel like it's always been like an undercurrent that, you know, draws me at different at different times in my life. I think that's such an important point, Winifred. Like when there is something that has been very defining for me, when there is just something that quiet, deep insistency that it just won't go away. And right. sometimes you may even try to, eh, eh, you know, I'm gonna go over here and do that, but then it's still there and it could come right back again. And I think that is an indication that it's something to be paid attention to. Exactly, I feel the same way. And I, you know, as you grow older, you kind of realize that and start to listen to yes. that and think, you know what, you know, maybe people say this or that, and this is important, that's important. But if you feel drawn to something, then even if you can't always explain it, it's worth it to, to follow that, I think. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. Absolutely. So, okay, why Japan? You moved to Japan, you lived in rural a rural area for close to 10 years. Why Japan? Well, that was um, a little bit different. Um, 
yeah. reason. So I actually moved there. I met a guy in Canada and started date. We started dating. He was Japanese. We were both traveling at the time and, uh, you know, just met and kind of connected. And yeah, so he was from Japan and he wanted to move back there. And I decided, you know, I was pretty young. I was like in my early twenties and I was like, okay, we're going to Japan. I'm going to live in Japan. Um, yeah, so we moved there and, and stayed for about 10 years. Um, and yeah, I was just thinking about it this morning, preparing for this interview. Um, I, I have an aunt who I'm, I'm, has always been kind of really supportive and um, encouraging in my life. And I remember asking her, hey, do you think I can learn Japanese and do all this? You know, I have no background in it. And she's like, yeah, I think you can. So I was like, okay. I, I'm gonna try and do that, and it worked out. You know, it just you know. So, so you did you didn't know any Japanese, like you didn't do high school Japanese or anything like that. So you went with your then boyfriend, who was he? You yeah. moved to the outskirts of Matsumoto, and then you just dove in and started to learn the language organically. Yeah, I am. Um, I had what studied. courage, Winifred. <laughs> Thank you. I think it was. Um, I didn't even realize it was courage at the time it just seemed exciting like a, a challenge to take on um you know I started studying a little bit after we met and then when we moved there I, I realized like I need to get serious about this um you know if I want to interact in this society like a like on an equal level with the the people here um and and go beyond just kind of surface uh sorry surface level interactions like the language is going to be a really important part of that and also trying to understand the culture more deeply so yeah at that point i really dove in and spent a couple of years like um kind of studying really intensively my on my own and with community there were kind of community classes and stuff okay i was going to ask was it formal yeah. or or on your own because you know i've heard uh, my best friend lived in kitakishu <laughs> for three years oh, and cool. she would always speak of how even after living there for three years it was difficult for her to really have a firm grasp on the language so it was from her that i understood the japanese is one of the most difficult languages to learn so for you to have learned it and now to be a completely proficient translator is amazing Thank you. It's completely an ongoing process. You know, I'm still learning with every project constantly, you know, looking into different terms and different concepts. I think it will go on for the rest of my life. But yeah, at least now I'm, it's wonderful to be able to start bringing literature and, and things I feel important from Japan into the English language for other people. And it really is wonderful because once you speak the language, I mean, it, it opens up, well, clearly because you were able to, to go out to the rural areas and spend the day with um, individuals to go to have the experience of foraging. So it opens up a completely new world to you when you, when you speak the language. I mean, whether it's foraging or developing intimate relationships and connections with individuals, it's very, it's very I want to say liberating because you're not limited in your experience anymore. Exactly. And that's, yeah, that's what I was constantly seeking was like, okay. it's that freedom to be able to interact however I wanted and to go as deep as I wanted in learning about things or creating relationships with people. Yeah. And, and not be limited by the language barriers, um, which, yeah, it's, it's something I'm still, still working on, but Okay, so your three favorite things you took with you to Japan and really dove into in Japan, food, culture, and nature. So what was a day of foraging like? I mean, I know you have different examples that you go out and speak with the individuals, but what what is a typical day of foraging like? Um, so in Japan, um, it's interesting how kind of the communities are set up there and the land is organized because um, in the United States, sometimes we have like these farms spread out across the landscape. Um, so it's, and then you'll have a forest, but it's kind of far away and a, a farm, but it's far away. So in Japan, everything is much more condensed. And I was living in a, a community on the outskirts of a city, for example, later on, at, towards the end of my time there outside of uh, 
uh, Matsumoto, where there was um, a cluster of houses, you know, a street full of houses, and then behind the houses were the farm fields, and then a five or 10 minute walk away was the forest. So you could just get up in the morning and take a little walk out to the woods and pick ferns, fiddlehead shoots, and, you know, um, all kinds of different spring, these delicious spring, they're called sansai in Japanese mountain mm -hmm. vegetables, um, and just bring them back to your house. So it was really integrated into daily life. It didn't feel like you had to take a special trip to go get, <laughs> get these things and to get out to quote unquote nature. Um, you were able to just do it as part of your everyday life, which was interesting. Um, and maybe you would walk over to the rice paddy and get some of the plants that live in a watery, marshy environment around the edges of the paddy. If you have an organic rice paddy, that doesn't work if you use a lot of agrochemicals, but um, traditionally, <laughs> a lot of wild plants grow around the paddy environment, as well as in more um, kind of what we would think of a more natural yeah, wooded environment. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense. I mean, you know, like I said, we just drove up to Northern California and it was just open agricultural land, no forest, no trees. So, so you're saying here it was accessible. It was easily accessible. But when yeah. you first went out, so obviously you didn't go out by yourself because how would you know what was poisonous and what was not? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Exactly. I was lucky enough to live in a community that was a, a fairly traditional farming community with a lot of elderly people who had, um, you know, long standing relationship with the natural environment, had learned about the plants from their parents and, you know, former generations. So they were really pretty strongly connected and knowledgeable and willing to share that knowledge with me. Um, I met one woman in particular who I write about in the book, Ban San. She was in her 80s. She lived just up the street from me. It's a wonderful woman, loved to read and write and uh, also to pick these wild plants. So she took me out sometimes, um, you know, just a short walk up to the edge of the woods and showed me what we could pick, told me how to prepare it. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the really important things about foraging. You can get a lot of knowledge from books and from the internet, but if you really want to learn, it's important to find these kind of mentors and learn this sort of living knowledge that's embedded in, in people who know very specifically, you know, there's a certain level of knowledge that is generally applicable to anywhere. You can open a book and say, this plant looks like this and it grows in this type of habitat. And maybe I'd find that in Japan or California or Illinois. But if you really want to get into a little bit, in a little bit deeper, um, you start to learn, okay, what are the local, local habitats, the local history of this plant, the local uses that, and that's really where the the, these kind of stronger connections to the local, to the land that people are living on exist in that more specific level of knowledge, I think. Okay, so this was a slow and steady process because you arrived there, you had to learn the language, you had the companionship um, of your then boyfriend, and you had to meet the locals. So initially you were going out with translators. And then as it, oh, no, okay. No, <laughs> no, I almost never used translators. I don't know okay. if I was stubborn or like, I was very much about learning on the job. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> so as, a, as I was working as a journalist um, starting, you know, maybe four, three or four years after I moved, I started doing some environmental journalism and Okay. I remember just spending hours preparing, looking up what words I would need to know and kind of stumbling through a lot of interviews and, and outings, but that was how I learned basically, yeah. Okay, okay. So you didn't use translators, but you had mentors or as you would call them or people who were very steeped in this mm -hmm. community, long history, deep connection to the land. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, um, yeah. 
I was going to say, yeah, and oftentimes those are the elderly, the elderly people, because a lot of that information is, and that knowledge is fading a bit, even in Japan, um, where there is still a strong culture of foraging and using wild foods. Um, unfortunately, with urbanization and changes like that, um, it, a lot of the younger generation is not, doesn't have that same kind of connection with the history and the food culture and the the natural um, environment. Yes, that is that is exactly what I was thinking about when I, you know, was reading Eating Wild Japan, how there are these aspects of traditional and what you could call or refer to as indigenous cultures, where they have these practices, traditional practices that are highly beneficial to us, you know, to, to people, but because of urbanization, these practices can be eroded. And so much information is lost, but it just felt like, you know, to walk out into, while reading it, to walk out into the forest. I mean, there, there, yes, you're foraging and you're looking for edible plants and uh, sensai wild vegetables, but there has to be something more deeper, something deeper, more spiritual when you are cultivating a relationship of sustenance, a natural relationship with the land where you're getting food and you're tending to it and you're not destroying it. It just seems so, um, so valuable. And yeah. yeah, just just thinking that that has repeatedly, like we've seen cultures where that has just been lost, but it is something so worthy of maintaining. Yeah, and yeah, there's so much that I'd like to respond to <laughs> that you just brought up. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, first of all, I think it's important to recognize that it's not only been lost, but in a lot of cases, it's been taken away quite actively, in many cases, intentionally taken away from people. I think because it is such a critical, important backbone of culture and connection and identity for people who are rooted in a place and have relationships to the non-human world, created over centuries, that creates a very strong rooted culture. And throughout history, you know, through the history of colonization, both in Japan and Asia and the United States, um, people recognize that and intentionally try to uproot it. In the United States, obviously, the most, I, probably the most famous example is the extermination of buffaloes. In the, in the uh, Midwestern mm -hmm. Plains, which was used mm -hmm. as a way to kind of destroy the cultures that depended on them mm -hmm. and that connection. In Japan, it happened uh, with the Ainu culture, an indigenous culture in far northern Japan, which uh, was very dependent on wild foods. That was a very central and is a very central part of Ainu culture. Uh, when mainland Japanese, Japanese came up from Honshu and colonized uh, Hokkaido, the Northern Island, one of the things they targeted was the use of wild foods. They actually made it illegal for people in certain cases to fish for salmon or to hunt for deer or to use. And they, there was an incredible amount of shame during say the, the 20th century amid, uh, I knew people amid kind of the culture became shameful to, to eat these foods. Um, it's so sad what happened with that. Like one of the most important foods in Ainu culture is called gyojin inniku. It's a, it's a kind of wild garlic, wild onion, wild garlic. Um, it's like ramps in the United States are quite popular, um, a similar plant to that. And um, so when you eat them, it makes you smell like garlic. And I, well, some of the women I talked to up there told me, the Ainu women told me that when they were children, you know, people, I knew people would avoid eating that because they didn't want to smell like that when they went to work with non I knew people because that was a symbol of their eating the wild plants and their culture. Yeah. And that was so, um, it, you know, it was so looked down upon at that time in history that they would, you know, they actually stopped, many people stopped eating those foods altogether. Now, fortunately, there's been a huge resurgence in traditional food culture, people lear learning about it again and kind of reviving it. So it hasn't been lost. It, it left, thankfully, you know, there it, it's being revived, but um, 
you know, I think it's important to recognize there, there's many different reasons why people become separated from those cultures. And, and oftentimes they're, they're less innocent than we, we may like to think, or, or it's mm -hmm. less about personal responsibility. It's less about individuals kind of drift, drifting away of their own free will many times. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And more about, because you, you do touch upon this. You talk about, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, the Tochi Mochi tree. Uh-huh. Yes, you are pronouncing it right. Tochi yes. <laughs> and being cut down for forest conversion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Tochi is a Japanese horse chestnut. Um, it grows very, is widespread across Japan. And it was a, a really important food um, for people who lived in the mountains to survive Kind of the harsh um, climate and harsh winters there. Um, it was a wild food that people would eat um, instead of rice or to supplement the, their rice harvest um, because sometimes it was quite difficult to grow rice in mountainous areas even though um, rice was considered like the national kind of staple food, the, the staff of life like we would consider bread here in the okay. United States. Um, yeah. But, but many people weren't able to grow enough rice to, to survive. So they continued to rely on wild foods like the horse chestnuts, which have to be extensively processed in order to be, be made edible. Um, you have to leach them to get certain toxic compounds out of them. But uh, anyhow, as it, food systems were um, globalized and Japan became wealthier, over the course of the 20th century, people's reliance on these trees kind of faded away. And as that happened, people started to value them less. They were intensely protected over the centuries because they were so important to people. So there were heavy penalties often for cutting them down. You know, people selectively um, preserved these trees in the forests around where they lived. And that all kind of just stopped when there was no longer a need for them, when people could just buy food from wherever, you know, you know, who cares if the rice crop isn't great this year, you know, it's no longer such a central part of, of the economy and culture. So sadly, those trees now are, are being targeted for kind of high end lumber and, and mm -hmm. flooring and tables and things like that and just being cut down and sold off um, in a lot of places. And discarding the parts that they don't need. And that, gosh, that, I thought I had that question here. It was, you write about, was it Satoyama? Yeah. And, and, and so she was talking about the, you said that, oh my gosh, let me see if I can remember it co correctly. She, uh, there was an older lady and she was talking about the loss of all of this in a way that you couldn't fully understand like when the trees were being cut down and, and what was lost. And it seemed, as I read it, it seemed that at that time, maybe because you were new to foraging or, or new in this environment, there was this, I don't know, this nostalgia, this sadness mm -hmm. for the loss that, that you couldn't quite relate to. And I was wondering, oh, I wonder if she understands it now, having been there for so long. Yeah, I definitely. Um... Right, things, these little comments that people make when you're talking to them, you know, in doing journalism, you know, people and these kind of feelings you pick up in, during interviews of, of this, yeah, like you talk about this sense of loss often. Um, yeah, and it, sometimes it doesn't make sense. It, it just sticks in your mind like, oh, what was going on with that person? And, and where were those feelings coming from mm -hmm. over the years, you know? and gradually starts to make sense. And especially through the process of writing this book and thinking about these plants and people's relationships to them and starting to forage more myself and he, even here where I live now in Illinois to make that part of my life now, it's really, really changed the way I think and the way I relate to nature um, and understand my place in nature. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned before, picking wild foods to eat. Um, yeah, when you, I, I've always loved gardening, but gardening involves going out and, and changing everything. You know, mm -hmm. you have to, you gotta dig up the ground, you gotta plant the seeds, you gotta bring in stuff from outside. Foraging is very different. It, it's a lot of 
observing very closely, watching what's going on, understanding, coming to know the place where you live, um, and then recognizing the abundance of it and receiving those things from nature. And you kind of just have this sense of awe, like, wow, nature provides for us. We don't always have to go in and change everything. <laughs> You know. Yes, I was thinking that like when, when I started, you know, reading the book and looking into foraging that I, I just kept having this thought food is everywhere, you know, and, and we can, I mean, you know, obviously not so obvious in urban environments, but the idea that this is a bountiful, plentiful earth oh, and yeah. that everything and that there's so many forms of abundance and that everything we need is here. But if you're not, if you don't have that perspective, if you don't if you can't see that, if you don't have that continued link to the land or gardening or whatever, or even this Buddhist concept of body and earth, one and the same oh, yeah. that you write about, um, it could be maybe hard to see this, but I like where you, you write that eating local foods harvest seasonally, whether you know, you're, I would say in Japan or here is so beneficial Foraging does provide that because it gives you the opportunity to have a varied diet that you write about, more balanced, and you can really lose that when you yeah. step away from that. Yeah, and I love that you bring up that expression, Shindo Fuji, body and earth, one and the same, which is just mm -hmm. one of my favorite, um, mm -hmm. favorite sayings. Um, I, I think about it all the time. Yeah. And it, you know, it brings up the fact kind of the flip side of developing this cult or coming to recognize this closer relationship that we are part of nature we are made to to be here um to benefit to to receive you know these plants from the earth if that's how we evolved and the flip side of that is kind of recognizing our vulnerability that yes we are part of nature which means that everything we do to this earth comes back to us and our bodies. Yes. Um, so if body and earth one and the same, well, that brings up some uncomfortable problems when we look at how we are currently treating the earth. Um, mm -hmm. One of the times I, I started to kind of understand this on a deeper, more um, kind of intuitive level was when I was reporting on the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster. I spent a lot of time in rural areas talking to people um, who did love to forage, who loved to hunt boar. They'd go out mushroom hunting, they'd hunt boar and deer. Um, and all of that was taken away from them by the, the nuclear fallout. Suddenly, you know, that abundant environment turned into the enemy. You know, you go outside mm. and suddenly you're wondering, like, is this? poisoning me. I can't rely on these. I can't have this relationship anymore because this invisible, these invisible um, contaminants are circulating through the natural environment now. So you, it really makes you realize, okay, I'm a part of this whole story and, you know, we need to watch out as far as, as far as what we're doing. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I think this your book is is so relevant and the timing is is so good because we are in such a time of transition with everything that you know has happened with the pandemic. And even though you're talking about food found in Japan, the I, I think the overall idea of the book connecting with nature through food, yeah. the remembrance of culture. And there is so much love and eloquence in your writing that I love it. And two, two things that I just have to point out, you know, before we end that I love. When you write the line, when you wrote, she gave me a little bell to warn off bears and pointed me in the direction of the local temple. I was like, did I read that right? To warn off bears, as in <laughs> bears, bears? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's bears that out there. So, I was like, what? <laughs> And you just took the bell and said, okay, and walked out the door. I was like, okay, I have to ask her about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, fortunately in Honshu, the main island, there's black, only black bears, which I think if you really make them angry, they will attack you. But they're, they're not like going to out, be out to get you. So as long as they can hear that you're coming, that's why you put the bell on. So you give them a little warning, they'll steer clear of you. 
up in Hokkaido, they do have brown bears, which are, are more like grizzly bears, which are a bit more, more dangerous. Um, but, That's amazing. <laughs> but in, in uh, Honshu, I never really felt that afraid. In fact, I always wanted to see one. I never had a chance to see one out in the wild. Um, My gosh, but that is the absolute beauty of travel. You have experiences that you would never have at home and it just it just like blows your mind open. I love it. <laughs> so yeah. what would you say that um, was the most, and, and I know that it's hard to narrow it down because you were there for such a long period of time, but what was the most surprising an unexpected part of being in Japan and immersing yourself in a second culture? Ah, um, gosh, there's so much, but one of the things I think is just um, thinking, beginning to think more on a community level and moving away a little bit from the individualism that I grew up with here in America, yeah. which has merits you know it's wonderful to go for what's best for you and to focus on your you know individual identity and everything but living in a culture that has has always emphasized community harmony a lot more and the role of the individual in the community as constantly being aware of that larger context that you are in that's both supporting you as you support it um, was just a really different perspective. You know, at first I kind of pushed back against it and really struggled with that concept of, wait, I have to think about why should I have to worry about what everybody else wants all the time? Why should I have to, you know, limit myself for the sake of the community? Over time, I've gradually started to see it as, you know, a kind of back and forth where we both mm -hmm. support each other rather than a kind of constrictive concept. So I think I'm still kind of struggling to work that out, that tension between individualism and community, mm -hmm. community harmony. Um, that, that's one of the things maybe that has stuck with me the most over the years. I really like that. Yeah, I, I just, I really like that because I, I can, I, I, I understand what you're saying. There, there is, um, a focus on individualism in this country. And there is just such intrinsic value in community, you know, that, you know, you can have a longing for, or, or, or you may not know it's community, but just being in an urban environment, you know, when you're in the box of an apartment or a separated home and community is not as strong as maybe it was once when we were children, you know, yeah. where you would go outside and play, like, and there is something to be said about commonalities and human connection and helping each other and the cycle of give and take that is expressed through food growing and harvesting and all that, that's so beautiful. So I, I can relate to what you're saying. I like that so much. Yeah. Well, we hope you enjoyed listening to this conversation with Winifred Bird. I could talk to you forever, Winifred. This oh, was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. This was wonderful. Little Visioneers is an independent bookstore that beyond selling books hosts community focused interviews and author events. Remember, the best way to support your local independent bookstore is as simple as buying a book. And Winifred is a journalist and a translator. She translates Japanese nonfiction and fiction and edits translations from Japanese. She can be reached at WinifredBird.com. Thank you, Winifred. Thank you so much. I really loved our conversation too. Yeah, I did too.